Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Delaware Student Success webinar about joining the military. We're really glad to have you here um, tonight. Just a few housekeeping um, pieces of information. Um, I want to um, mention that all of the attendees, um, no one's video is being shown tonight and you are all muted. So please, please enter any questions that you have in the chat and our presenters will be happy to um, answer them as they go along. Um, on this call with me tonight are my colleagues from the University of Delaware Institute for Public Administration who are helping us to run these webinars. So thanks to them. Um, I wanna just call your attention to the whole series of webinars that we have. We've had several of them so far, but they have all been recorded and they're all posted on the DelawareStudentSuccess.org website. Everything about how to apply to college, how to identify your interests. All of our Delaware colleges and universities have done presentations. Um, we have the military session tonight with the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, and Air Force. And then next week we have the Air National Guard and the um, Army National Guard um, as well. So, um, and then we have a session on resumes, interviews and cover letters, apprenticeships and industry certification. So lots of information to help you make your decisions about what you might wanna do once you graduate from high school. And the only other thing I wanna mention is we have a texting program, Delaware Student Success Texting Program. Um, you can text the word success to 302 492-2092 and we will send you next steps that you might want to think about doing to get ready for your career and for college if you choose to go to college. We'll send you information on the upcoming webinars and you can also text us back with questions um, and we will answer your questions along the way. So it's a really good resource if you, so to help you not be stuck with something you're trying to figure out. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our two Army recruiters tonight. Sergeant Rose and Sergeant Moore are going to spend the next half an hour talking to you about um, opportunities in the Army. So thank you both for being with us tonight. Thank you for having us. Uh, so essentially uh, what we are are the United States Army Active Duty and the United States Army Reserve. Um, I'm representing the active duty army and Sergeant Rose will be representing the reserve. Um, just to give you guys a little bit of background on me, uh, my name is Sergeant Joshua Moore. I've been in the army for about seven years. Uh, I've been to uh, countless places. I've been to Germany, Korea, Italy, um, and also uh, Fort Drum, New York. It's a little cold up there. Uh, and also Fort Riley, Kansas. I know a lot of you probably have no clue where those places are, but it kind of gives you an idea on what it's like being in the army. You know, you get to travel, you get to go to all the awesome places, do these awesome things. Um, I was born in Baltimore, Maryland. You know, I am a Ravens fans. Um, I don't want to hear anything from any of the Steelers fans. We'll talk about it next week. All right. Uh, also, uh, raised in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, so I'm a Cardinals fan as well. Uh, and I joined the army, honestly, because I had to just change up what I was doing. Uh, I went to school to become a teacher. I was teaching for about three or four years. And afterwards I decided to myself, mm, it's not necessarily for me. So I went and talked to the army recruiter and one of my friends had referred me to him and he was telling me, he was like, oh man, you're going to be doing all this awesome stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I just kind of want to work on helicopters. And he was like, you want to work on helicopters? I was like, yeah. I mean, my grandfather was a pilot in Vietnam, so I'll follow in his footsteps and I'll just become a mechanic. So I scored high enough on the ASVAB and I was able to get the job of 15 Hotel. That is Aircraft Neutralics Repairman. Uh, I've been doing it for about the past seven years and I love it. I kind of chill in my office fix a couple things, put it back on the aircraft, make sure it's ready to go, make sure it's good to fly and it takes off. And I kind of go back into my office and kind of chill out. Uh, other than that, I mean, um, that's a little bit about me. Sergeant Rose, you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself? Hey everyone, so I'm Sergeant Rose. I started off my career in the Army Reserves. 
I grew up in the middle of nowhere in Arkansas, off of a dirt road, off of a dirt road. Um, at 17, really didn't have a clue what I wanted to do after high school and only had a few more months left of high school. So I ended up talking to a handful of recruiters and the army was the only branch that could promise me a job in dental hygiene. So as a 17 year old kid, I wanted to be a dentist. I thought that would be a really good career start. <clears throat> um, so I went to basic training and AIT at basic training. As soon as I got there, I had to um, regather myself because I was like, what in the world am I doing here? This was a bad decision. Everybody was nonstop yelling and here I am naive, shy. I'm only five foot tall, by the way, ready to cry constantly because everybody's just yelling nonstop. Um, but by the end of it, I was like, all right, cool. They were just breaking us down, building up as a team. Um, we all were like really close, had really great camaraderie between each other. And then when I got to AIT, which is advanced individual training, um, it was more of a college classroom setting. They were all hands-on instructors and they were more focused on you learning the material and learning your new job, which for me was dental hygiene. I walked out of AIT as a dental hygienist certified, came back to Arkansas um, and started going to college because the military does pay for 100% of your college and realized that I really liked active duty. So I started hopping on active duty orders here and there and traveling all over. I found a love for photography and traveling to the military and it's what I like to do. Um, I'm now a recruiter, but like I tell most everyone with their lives, the military isn't for everyone. Each branch isn't for everyone. Um, it's your life, so just make a choice that makes you happy. Um, tomorrow's not promised, so be happy in all that you do and never grow stagnant in anything. Um, I think the biggest regret I have and wish I could go back and tell myself was to keep moving forward. I would get so iffy on making the right decision on which way to go because I was so unsure of myself and unsure of the path I was supposed to be in. But as long as you keep moving forward, you'll get somewhere. So I don't know what else to talk. About. Well, so there's, everyone has their reasons for joining the army. Uh, some people it's a little bit more for serving their country. And, you know, that's those really patriotic, go get it guys. Um, you know, there are all those peoples in all sorts of backgrounds that have this willingness to serve. Uh, the other is occupational and career enhancement. These are for individuals who are looking to get a job. One, they're thinking like long-term effects. Like for example, one of my uh, good friends, he decided that he was gonna go into the army so he can get a job as a 25 series. Basically, it deals with communications and everything like that. Um, he was able to get a top secret security clearance and the army paid for him to get the actual training in which he used to be able to help get him a job. It's like top of the line training that you can't get anywhere else. And it's very few places that's gonna pay you for that training. So after he was done, he got out and he works down in Washington, DC making easily six figures a year. And I remember sitting there, I was like, bro, like why, what made you decide to do that? He was like, look, man, I knew what I wanted to do in my life. All right, I didn't have any means of getting there by myself. So what I did was I had the army basically help me along the way and kind of guide me in the direction so I can be as successful as I wanna be. Another reason, is because honestly, we have over 150 different jobs, 150 different jobs to choose from, all right? Only 11 of those are combat jobs, all right? If you want a combat job and you're so gun ho and you're ready to go shoot big guns, jump out of helicopters and do some awesome stuff, there's jobs for that. If you wanna be a little bit more reserved and you kind of wanna be in the office, you know, making sure paperwork's correct, there's a job for you there. If you want to be a mechanic, you want to work with your hands, you love breaking things apart, putting them back together, and then after that, seeing if it works correctly, hey, see, we have that as well. There's so many different options that we have for individuals looking for any sort of change in their life. 
Um, one other reason I would say, at least for me, was education as well. Okay, we pay for schooling, we pay for your for you to actually get your college degree, uh, no matter what field it's in. Um, we do cover for individuals who are, let's say, for instance, you're wanting to be full time as an active duty soldier, but you want to also go to school at the same time, part time. There is a way for that. We have this thing called tuition assistance. It's for individuals who are full time soldiers and they want to be a part time student. It works out in your way. That way you're able to get the most bang for your buck. And it doesn't even come from your GI Bill. That's totally separate. So you don't even have to worry about it taken away from your GI Bill. The other thing I would say is leadership. The Army values itself on its leaders, all right? As a non-commissioned officer, basically we are the ones that in charge, uh, charge of the soldiers. We're the ones that's corralling them together to accomplish the mission. We are the ones that's gonna be able to motivate our soldiers, give them the directions and the actual guidance and in they, in what they're gonna need in order to become successful. And those sorts of things are what job opportunities and what like CEOs of big Fortune 500 companies are looking for. A lot of times it's not the individual that's the brightest, but the individual that can get a group of individuals to come together and work as a team. Those are gonna be the things that's gonna catapult you far beyond any of your counterparts and your other classmates and other things like that. Um, as far as diversity, you can't get no better than a military. It's, it's gonna have you gathering so many different peoples from different walks of life. If I wasn't in the, in the military, in the army specifically, I would have never met Sergeant Rose, all right? I would have never met <laughs> Like, honestly speaking, like, that is, like, one of my closest friends in the office. Like, we joke, we have a great time, we laugh, and you're never going to find friends like that whenever you're going through life. I know I can rely on her. If anything happens, I know she can rely on me. It's, it's like this, this bond that you get with one another. Um, and also, as far as diversity, you get to travel. You get to travel the world. The only limitations you have are up to you. People take their time all the time and they just go traveling with their free time in the army. You get 30 days of free leave. What you do with it, that's up to you. Me, me and my wife, we go traveling everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I try and get Rose to come along, but she's all like, oh, no. no. I've been all over the world traveling on the Army's dime because of the same. Uh, traveling is what makes me happy. So I spend my money doing that, going to Greece and Italy and Korea and places. Um, Germany, I've been all over Germany. I actually took two months and played all over Germany, got on and off the Euro trail. Um, uh, I was going to say too, with college, you are able to go to college and be active duty. That's what a lot of people don't understand too. Reserves is great for just going to college. If you just want to go to college, you don't want to have to mess with doing the military. You only do the military one week in a month and your college is hundred percent paid for. Basic training is nine weeks long. Your AIT can be anywhere from five weeks to one year long. It depends. You can go on to goarmy.com and see how long the AIT training is going to be for whatever job you're looking at. Goarmy.com also has a whole lot of jobs listed so you can read about that job for whatever interests you. I am, um, while active duty actually, finished my bachelor's degree in psychology. I ended up getting a second bachelor's here at Wilmington University in criminal justice. I have a few classes left to finish my master's. I get sidetracked to be honest with recruiting has been the busiest job we've had in the army. Um, any other job I've had, like with dental hygiene, when we didn't have work to do, we went home. I worked at a dental clinic every day. I went to work in scrubs. I had the weekends off. And then when it came to recruiting, we spend a lot of times talking to parents, talking to students after hours and on the weekends, what fits your schedule. So it's been a little bit more difficult now to finish my master's than it has been on the regular army side, but you are able to do both and your college books, housing's paid for on the active duty side. On the reserve side, only your college and books are paid for. They're not gonna pay for your housing while you're only doing one week in a month for the army. 
Um, however, when you are a reservist, something people don't tell you is we have a website you can get on and apply for active duty tours. And there's some over in Baltimore, there's some over in Fort Dix, New Jersey, there's some even here at the Dover Air Force Base. Um, but you can do one, two year tours and just get some active duty pay because um, it's a nice paycheck as well. If you're not interested in doing completely full time military. And if you do do the military and it's not for you, you do your contract and you get out. Um, worst case scenario, you do three years and you're like, oh, this was a mistake. I hate it. And you didn't make the best friends of your life and travel all over the world and you hate your job. You still come out certified in whatever job you selected. You come out with your college paid for. You come out with all the money you saved on top of your medical insurance and everything else you left with. So you still come out on top, even if you decided it was a mistake because you're still certified in that, that job. If you did radiology, you're a certified radiologist. If you're a helicopter mechanic, you are a certified helicopter mechanic. You don't lose that because you get out. So whatever you end up doing with your life, it's a good path to go into at least get started. I joined just to get college paid for. That was it. I planned to do my six years and bounce. I ended up staying in because I was like, I like this. I like traveling. I liked that they pay for my house. They pay for my mortgage right now. Um, I liked making new best friends everywhere I go. Um, I like it. I like the lifestyle. I really do. I love my family in the military. I would, I might go back to Arkansas to visit my sister occasionally, but just like with you guys all being here in Delaware, it might be time to scoot. Uh, do you want to start taking on some of these questions, well, Sergeant Joshua that's, Moore? That's actually what I was going to go into. Um, one question I see is that uh, when can you take the ASVAB test? Um, so in order for you to actually process into the Army, you have to be qualified in three areas, all right? You have to be test qualified. That means you have to be able to pass the ASVAB. You have to be medically qualified. That means you have to be in good medical health, overall great health and no major issues. And the other one is moral. That means your law violations and things like that. You have to make sure that you're able to process in and have no major law violations, be in good physical health and also be able to pass the ASVAB. The ASVAB test is taken Usually once you meet up with your recruiter, he's the one or she is going to be the one that sets up the actual ASVAB test for you. Your schools also have actual ASVAB testing as well. Usually most schools do it one, two times a year, depending on the school. Um, the minimum score you need is a 31. That is your minimum score. And it goes up to a 99, I believe. Um, with that, Honestly speaking, we give you a lot of study material that you can use in order to help you pass that test um, and also to increase your scores because what job opportunities you're going to get is all going to be based off your ASVAB score. You score higher, you get more jobs to choose from. There is an app that you guys should download regardless of what branch or whatever you decide to do. It's the ASVAB Challenge app. Can you see it? <laughs> but it's really great. It's really useful. There's also, um, I don't know if you guys use TikTok, but there is a guy, Justice the Tutor on TikTok, and he's great. It's a lot of 10 second videos that help you a lot with some of the ASVAB questions. Um, as far as the questions on where to take the ASVAB and what website to go to to register, just text or call one of the phone numbers in the chat. That's my number and his number. We will register for you guys to take the ASVAB and start the process and everything else and get you on a practice test and see what help you need to in order to um, join the military. What else questions do we have? Um, I saw one asking, how long do you go away for for, uh, for the reserves? So with any branch, you're gonna have to go to basically some form of basic training, okay? The Army's basic training is 10 weeks long. Uh, Trust me, it is not long at all. You won't have any time to realize how long it has been because it happens like, <laughs> you know, they break it down to three different phases. You know, the red phase, that's where they're screaming at you. Everybody's running around. You're like, I don't know. Then after that goes into the blue phase and that's when they kind of back off you a little bit. That's when you start 
qualifying with your weapons. That's when you start doing some cool stuff. That's when you start doing like team building exercises. And then after that, you go into the white phase. White phase is a little bit more getting you ready for graduation. Uh, that's when you're going to get your dress uniform. You're going to look all good. You're going to look spiffy. And then after that, you get to come all the way out through the smoke and your parents haven't seen you in weeks, months, and they're all crying and boohooing. But those honestly are great moments to have. Um, but that's not long at all. Uh, basic training is 10 weeks. Um, and honestly speaking, you don't have to be in the best shape whenever you go down yeah, there. Yeah. Well, he said, don't, don't. So we get a lot of kids that are like, oh, I gotta, I'm not physically fit. I can't join yet. I don't know how to do a push up. They teach you how to do that stuff in basic training. I could not run for the life of me in basic training. I had never played any sports. I still can't throw for nothing. Um, <laughs> but um, in basic training, they teach you how to get there. They have you running Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays. They start having you run further and faster as the weeks go on they have you doing push-ups daily so you're gonna you're gonna be able to do a push-up by the time you leave basic training so don't i would advise you to start running ahead of time so you're not sore because being sore is what's going to get to you being there but i would not worry about i mean you could do it like i did i literally just woke up and i was like eh, i'll worry about it when i get there all right. And honestly speaking, it works out for some people. Me, I'm not a strong runner. And guess what? I became one when I got the basic. All right. The whole point of basic is to build you up. We don't expect you to be in the top notch physical fit shape to, you know, ever grace this earth. We don't need you there. All right. <laughs> we just need you to be able to work hard. And that is it. If you can only do two push ups by the time you leave basic training, all right, good job. That means you started from doing zero. Now you could do two. So now awesome. it's just something to build on. Also, like um, with the basic training too, with running, everybody thinks they need to be an athlete. For me to pass my two mile run, I only need to run it in 20 minutes. So don't think that you have to be some all-star athlete in the military in order to pass your run. Now, if you do well, that's more points for you and for promotions, but don't think you have to be an athlete. And one of the other questions I see is why did I select the army versus other branches? So I did shop when I was your age. Um, I talked to every branch because I was curious to what was out there. And when I talked to the Air Force, they were iffy on what my job was going to be. And I didn't, I didn't like that. You couldn't tell me nothing at that age. I wanted to be dental and dental was what it was. Um, I talked to the Marines and they were a little bit abrasive. Um, but I think they were testing me for thick skin because if you don't have thick skin, you're not going to make it in the Marines. And then I don't know where the Navy was at the time or Coast Guard or anything else. I just only talked to the Marines and the Air Force. Uh, I think every branch has other things to offer and you will not go wrong with whatever branch you choose. I think any branch you go with is gonna make a huge life-changing impact and it's gonna be a huge career move for you and it's gonna do great things for you. So don't ever think that like, I don't know which to choose. You'll be fine. And later on, if you get into the Marines or the army and you're like, Oh, I hate this. It's not for me. You can switch branches. Just like going from reserves to active duty, you put in a conditional release and you switch branches. It's not as hard as you think it would be. So don't, don't get too caught up on figuring out which branch is best for you. Eventually it's going to be a joint task force anyways. And we're all going to be doing the same. Awesome. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I see one, someone asks what's OSIT. Um, now, OSIT is for individuals who are going to become infantrymen. Uh, they, be, yeah, those types of guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> OSIT is basically, instead of majority of the time, you go to basic training and then you have a little pause and you travel to your actual AIT, advanced individual training. That's where you learn your job. But for infantrymen, they basically condense it all into one and they call it OSIT. That's a combination of basic training and infantry school. So they basically learn all their basic army skills during basic training. And then afterwards, they immediately start their actual OSET training. That's where they're actually learning how to become a more skilled infantryman, get more acquainted with their rifle, make sure they're able to shoot from far distance, use grenades, landmines, uh, C4, blow stuff up, blowing up doors, kicking in doors, and just doing things mm -hmm. in which an infantryman does on a daily basis. 
Um, there was another question about ROTC. So I did Air Force ROTC in high school because that's what my high school offered. It doesn't matter what ROTC you're in or what you did. They're all going to help you mostly with like marching because some people couldn't march in basic and they were getting yelled at for not being able to march or right face, left face stuff. So it's all helpful regardless of which ROTC you're not promised into that branch. And there's also something I heard too that was going around that there's a placement test for you for which branch you belong to. That's not a real thing. There's not a placement test for which branch you belong to. Whichever branch you want to join is what you want to join. Whatever gives you what you need. Like with the Army Reserves, I have a lot of people joining the reserves and then switching over to active duty mostly because right now the Army Reserves, if you score above a 50 on the ASVAB, that ASVAB is important. You get a $30,000 student loan repayment program. Your college for a four-year degree is paid for on top of a kicker for textbooks and living expenses and stuff like that. Um, one girl that just enlisted got two, uh, uh, she got a $15,000 bonus, a $17,000 kicker, a $30,000 student loan repayment program, and then the regular GI Bill and stuff like that. So she's, she said, but she also got a 76 on the ASVAB. So study on that ASVAB. Oh, and she's paralegal. What kind of a cool Ooh. job is that? She's going to be working as a lawyer assistant. Like, what? Right out of the military. You know, a lot of times people don't realize that we have all these different job categories. And honestly speaking, that's what's going to make it the biggest difference between us and the other branches. Um, not saying that we're better than anyone else, because honestly speaking, they all have their purpose. Um, but for the United States Army, what we offer is going to be basically, we give it to you black and white. We don't want there to be any confusion. We don't want there to be anything in which you're not sure of. Whenever you sit down and you look over your contract, it's going to state everything in which you need to know. When you're going to basic training, where you're going to basic training, how long it's going to be, how long your job training is going to be, and the location of all of those things. Also, in the contract, it will state if you're going to get a bonus or not up front. Um, we're not very good on like trying to determine whether or not if we can, we literally tell you right then and right there, if you're going to be getting a bonus. Um, that's the great thing about us. And honestly speaking, we're the biggest branch. So finding actual job placements that much better. I can, I can seriously put you in whatever job you want to be in the reserves with us being the largest branch, as long as I can find a position for you. I see that we only have a few minutes left. So again, my contact information, I'll read, put it in the chat room for you guys to text. I can answer any questions for other branches if needed. I will give you the recruiter information to you if you'd like it. I know Navy, Air Force, and Marines are all going to be on next. Um, my husband is active duty Air Force as well. So if you guys need anything at all, just let me know. Uh, same with Sergeant Joshua Moore. I'll put his contact information in there as well. Feel free to text us. We'll answer your questions after this as well. If you have any additional questions, I, it was nice talking to everybody. It was great to, to meet everyone. Talking. You have Can a great you, day. Um, hi everyone, it's um, Karen Keegan again. Um, there was one question from a parent about when in the school year her son should take the ASVAC. Does it matter if it's now or later in the school year? I think um, taking it as many times as possible is important. Um, it doesn't matter when you take it, it's good for two years, but the sooner the better and the student ASVAB is easier than the regular ASVAB. So that's why we recommend taking that in school while it's still all fresh. Um, I hope that answered your question. I honestly think that if you um, just take your time, take the ASVAB as soon as possible. One, it gives you a baseline to see where you're scoring at in comparison and see what areas you need to improve on. Um, so that way, if you have to retake it, you know what areas you can pencil in and focus on to increase those scores. Well, thank you so much. You guys are very much on time. Sergeant Rose, Sergeant Moore, we really appreciate you being here for our students um, and for the students and the parents on the call. Certainly, if you have specific questions, obviously, you'll need more information. This was just an overview of some opportunities, um, please reach out to them so they can right. direct you better. So I don't know if they're gonna be able to see the chats later, the whole chat when it's recorded. So I'm gonna go ahead and give out our phone numbers over this. Is that okay? Sure. 
So get a pen and pencil and write this down. My phone number is 302-382-4639. Sergeant Joshua Moore is 732-648-9487. Uh, feel free to text us anytime. We'll get back to you or follow us on Instagram. Hey. Thank you so much. Thank you, Army. We're happy to have you. Okay, and so now we are going to transition to the Navy, and we have Petty Officer Gregory Collins. Um, uh, I know that guy. Hey. Can you put your video on there? He is. I think it should be on. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we can see you. So thank you very much for joining us, and we will turn it over to you and have you talk about your um opportunities in the Navy. Thank you very much. And you have until eight o'clock. Great. What's up, Army? Um, they had a couple people to handle it, but in the Navy, we can hold things down, you know, by ourselves. So I don't need any backup. That's my only shot at the Army. So I'm here to talk about the Navy, what we can do for y'all. I'm sure you heard a lot about, um, you know, paying for school, ASVAB, um, all kinds of stuff like that. So I'll give you a brief overview of what the Navy does. 70% um, of the world's trade happens through shipping. So obviously in the word shipping, ship, the Navy has ships, uh, we patrol the world's oceans. So uh, most of our bases are on the coast. So those of you that like the beach, like that sort of coastal type thing, it's super easy to get stationed at the beach when you're in the Navy because the ships need to be in the water. Now. That doesn't mean every single job in the Navy is on a ship. Uh, a lot of our jobs have to do with supporting the ships and the personnel who are on the ships. Um, and then we also have a lot of uh, various fields like, uh, you know, aviation, where th those people would be involved in station at squadrons. So they're going to be on bases that have all kinds of different aircraft, fighter jets, helicopters everything you can think of. Um, there's actually more fighter uh, jets in the Navy than in the Air Force. So that's a little fun fact. Um, but the majority of people in the Navy are stationed on ships. Um, so if you're looking at the military as a stepping stone for your future, maybe not the end goal, maybe you don't wanna do an entire 20 year career, um, the cool thing about the Navy is any job that you do with us is going to be involved with ships. And because maritime trade is such a big thing in the world, you can translate that job into the civilian sector and shipping and, and, and be able to basically move your skills over without any sort of uh, retraining or anything like that. Um, the Navy Basic training is all about orientation to the Navy, how to wear the uniforms, how to recognize rank, uh, how to treat people appropriately. It's not so much about wearing a heavy backpack and hiking around or running. We're on ships. So if we need something somewhere, we just sail there and drop it off on the shore. Uh, we don't need to carry everything around with us on our backs. Uh, so that's one of the benefits of being in the Navy. Um, we do have PT standards, so you are going to have to be able to run a mile and a half, be able to do push-ups, and we phased out sit-ups. We're now doing planks. We've, we find that uh, planks are just as effective for making sure that you have a solid core uh, without the threat of hurting your back. Um, it's a really simple test. A lot of people ask us about, hey, I hear that in boot camp you have to swim. That's correct. There is a swim test in the Navy. You're going to jump off a little platform into a pool come up out of the water and gives a thumbs up to the lifeguard, say, I'm not panicking. Um, I'm not uh, drowning. And then you just start swimming. It's a hundred yards. You can swim any stroke you want, backstroke, side stroke, do the crawl, um, doggy paddle. As long as you're making progress and you don't look like you're panicking, you're good to go. There's no time limit for that. You don't have to be Michael Phelps. So, um, if you're not a good swimmer or you don't know how to swim at all, that's not a problem either. When you get to the pool day and basic training for the Navy, they're going to say, who can't swim? Get in this line. They're going to take you to the shallow end of the pool and they're going to start swimming with you. 
So the cool thing about uh, our special forces guys, when they rotate back from being in the action, a lot of them come to the recruit training command and teach people how to swim. So you might be in the shallow end of a pool with a SEAL, uh, you know, who's done who knows how many tours of Iraq or Afghanistan, uh, and they're teaching you how to, to do the freestyle stroke, which is pretty neat. So um, another big thing I hear about people saying, well, I don't want to be on a ship for that long because they're imagining that a Navy deployment, you're going to get on the ship and you're going to just be in the middle of the ocean for six months and that's it. That's not how we work. I've been to 22 countries so far. I've done three deployments. I've been in for 10 years. All right. Well, December will be 10 years for me. I'm not a career recruiter. In a couple of months, I'm leaving here and I'm going back down to Florida and I'm going to be on a ship down there. So this is just a three year tour for me. Anyway, on our deployments, we do the mission for a couple of weeks. It depends on the type of ship that you would be on, what your mission is. And then you pull into a port and you go out in town for three, four days, do whatever you want, as long as you're not making a bad choices and you're being a good example. Um, so you can go, you know, try the local food, go see uh, art exhibits or other things. I toured the Parthenon when I was in Athens. Um, I've been to Naples. I've been to Rome. I've been all over Southern Spain, been to Jerusalem, Dubai, Bahrain, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Rhodes, Malta. The Navy moves around and we just go from port to port to port. Part of our mission is to talk to uh, local people and basically pull in, you know, buy their food, buy their merchandise and show goodwill from America. So it's called community relations. So you're not going to just go to the same few places in the Navy or be landlocked or get stuck in a desert somewhere. Um, you're literally going to have the opportunity to, to travel the world. Now, I've only been stationed on the East Coast so far, but if I were stationed on the West Coast as a West Coast sailor, I'd go to, you know, Guam, Singapore, um, Thailand, Japan, Korea, um, Hawaii, all those Pacific countries um, would be the focus. And I'm hoping that in the second half of my career, I'll be able to go over there and do that. Now, many of you are in high school. Um, I think all of you are. So uh, you're trying to figure out what you want to do after your life. I'm sure a lot of people are pushing you towards college. There's nothing wrong with college. I graduated from Westchester University in 2009. Um, but if I had joined straight out of high school, I'd be retiring in three years. So I like to think I don't look old enough to be retiring in three years. But um, that's the reality of it. If you choose to make this a career for yourself, for your whole uh, you know, adult life, or not entire, but you know, the beginning of your adult life, you could be retired before you're 40. Uh, earning a pension, keeping your medical benefits, and you could do whatever you wanted. You could start a second career. You could, uh, if you were financially responsible, you could retire and live off your money. Um, so really, there's a lot of options there. Um, I see a couple of questions in the chat. Um, keep... Oop, there. I'm going to try to. Uh, I'm going to try to look at these questions here. I don't want to talk the whole time. Um, I'm hoping I can answer some of them for you satisfactorily but um a couple other key points i wanted to mention we do have tuition assistance so those of you that are interested in further education you can uh if you go active duty you can go to college at the same time as you're um in the navy it's just you're going to be doing college part-time because the navy is your full-time job so for every year that you're active duty, you have $4,500 worth of uh, tuition that's paid for by the Navy, and you don't have to follow any specific major. You can take art classes this semester and math and science next semester and do whatever you want. Um, every year, just continue your education. Uh, a lot of us are working on master's degrees, stuff like that. Um, and then in that way, you don't even have to touch your GI Bill. You can use it when you get out. Or you can give it to uh, children eventually if you have them or a spouse, um, or you could just use it for more further education. So work on a PhD or something. Um, so if you choose to be active duty Navy, there is the tuition assistance there so that you can work on college at the same time. The Navy on deployment will send professors out to the ship and, and teach certain uh, common 
core classes so that while you're on a deployment, you could come back with college credits uh, plus that experience of the deployment. For me, I like deploying. Um, I work on a weapon system that shoots down missiles. So on a day-to-day -day basis, I go out there, I do maintenance on my system. I train my junior techs who aren't as experienced so that they can replace me someday. And, uh, you know, do practice shoots, throw a 55 gallon barrel in the water and, and do a 180 and come by and light it up with all our guns and stuff. It's pretty cool. Um, I know there's some parents out there that are concerned about the safety side of things. Being on a ship is inherently dangerous in its own way because ships move and there's all kinds of machinery and stuff. Um, but in my three deployments and my five years on a destroyer, I never had anybody fall over the side. I never, never had anybody seriously injured. Safety is a huge priority for the Navy. We want to take care of our sailors. Our motto is ship, shipmate, self. So, um, and I've never been shot at. I've never had to kill anybody. Um, that's my personal experience. I've, I did two tours in the Persian Gulf and I did one Mediterranean tour. So uh, as far as the military goes, it's, it's a safe it's a safe route to go. Um, you're going to receive a lot of technical training um, and you're going to be in an environment that is going to allow you to grow if you, whether you decide you want to make a career of it or just do four years or six years or some amount of years just to network. Um, I know people all over the world now because of my time in the Navy and they keep offering me jobs, but I keep telling them, look, I, I'm going to reenlist. I want to finish my 20 years. I'm married now. I have two kids, um, a pension for the rest of my life. Starting at 45 sounds pretty great to me. I joined late. I was 25. Like I said, I went to college first. Um, I think I saw a question down there in the chat. I'm trying to figure out how to read it without interrupting everything. Uh, let's see. Oh, wow. Okay. We can read you the questions if that's easier. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I've got can I go to college and serve in the Navy? Can you all still hear me? Yes. So yes, you can go to college and serve in the Navy. Uh, like I said, you can go active duty and go part-time college, which means you're going to take a couple classes per semester as opposed to a full load. And your main focus is going to be your Navy job and the college will be on the side, or you can do the reserves and be a full-time college student with the Navy being on the side. It just depends on what your plan is and what you really want to do. A lot of people just want to get out of Delaware, go explore the world. There's nothing wrong with Delaware, but you can drive from east to west in like 20 minutes from north to south in like two hours. So like there's a lot more world out there to see. I'm uh, from a blue collar family. We didn't vacation in Europe in the summer. Um, we would go to Jersey Shore and visit our cousins, like, you know, a couple of times a summer. That was a vacation for me. Now I've been all over the world. So um, the other thing was uh, the question about tattoos. Now, obviously, I got a little bit of ink. Um, the Navy's tattoo policy is really relaxed. Uh, traditionally, sailors got tattoos, um, and the Navy reflects that by having a very relaxed tattoo policy. You can't have face or neck tattoos, but you can have anything else tattooed that you want as long as it's not inappropriate or racist or gang-related tattoos. You can have your hands tattooed if you want, you can have full sleeves. I'm working on mine, um, you know, elbows, knees, toes, you name it. You can have tattoos in the Navy. It's just part of our heritage and our, and our culture. So um, yes, you can have tattoos. Now, I don't recommend getting tattoos until you know what you want. I didn't have a single tattoo until I was 26. Um, I got a tattoo to commemorate finishing my, um, my first deployment and then some other stuff. Um, but you know, it's your choice. If you join the Navy, you can get tattoos. Um, so a little bit about our training pipeline. If you decided that you wanted to look into the Navy, you'd talk to me. Um, if you're in the Northern part of Delaware, I'd be a recruiter. If you're Southern or more central, uh, then I get you in touch with a recruiter down that direction. And you would basically come in, talk to us. We'd, you know, see what your goals are for the future, whether or not we think the, the Navy would be a good fit for you, answer any questions you have. If you decide that you want to go further, you go to MEPS, the military entrance processing station, just like uh, in the other branches, you can have a physical, they're going to give you the ASVAB exam. If you don't already have a test from school and then you'll sit down with a detailer 
and they're going to give you a list of jobs that you qualify for. So you're sitting there, you'll have all of your options right in front of you. When you find a job that you're happy with, they'll write a contract up for you. And you sign for that job. It'll, it'll say how long you're enlisting for, what, you know, what job you got, and any bonuses that are associated with it, what day you go to boot camp, it's all on your contract. So there's no ambiguity. You know what you're getting. Um, and then you go to basic training. When you complete that, you go to your job training school. And when you complete that, you'll go to uh, your further command, usually a ship, but not always. Um, that's where do sailors sleep on the ships? Okay, so that's a good question. So ships are self-contained. We have everything that we need on there. We make our own fresh water. We make our own electricity. We have satcoms for you can get on Amazon and buy gummy bears or whatever you want, and they'll fly it out to the ship on a helicopter. You can get on Instagram and talk to your friends or whatever, you know, social media you look, use to chat with people. Um, so on the ship, we have what's called a birthing. In the birthing, you have um, beds. They're bunk beds. Obviously, space is at a premium. The ship I was on had about 230 sailors on it. It was 505 feet long. It's a destroyer, so it's just packed full of weapon systems and cool technology. And you have a bed. It's about that thick. And um, it opens up and inside is hollow. So you can put your your clothes in there. You can put, you know, whatever stuff you want to store. And then you also have a stand up locker to keep your uniforms from getting wrinkled. So in a ship, on a ship, you sleep in a bed. We call it a rack. Um, and you got curtains to pull close. So you have a little bit of privacy. And then, um, you know, you jump out of there. It's air conditioned. You got heat you know, all the modern conveniences of normal life. Jump out your rack, go around the corner, regular bathroom, running water, sinks, toilets, you know, showers with doors, just a regular convenience. It just happens to be on a ship. So you, in the Navy, unless you're doing special forces, you're not going to have to sleep in a hole somewhere. Um, you're not going to have to go days without bathing. We actually encourage everybody to take a shower every day. Um, Cleanliness is super important on ships. It's part of our naval tradition. Um, we're, we're cleaning, staying clean. So um, that's a good question. What kind of weapons do sailors use? So I'm actually a marksmanship instructor for the Navy. I volunteered to go to that course to learn to teach people how to shoot. Uh, we have pistols, rifles, shotguns, grenade launchers, machine guns. Um, so to answer that question, we have small arm stuff uh, for standing watch um, and for just being prepared for anything. And then we have large crew serve weapons on mounts. So 50 caliber machine guns, 240 Bravo. Um, we've got 25 millimeter uh, automatic weapon. Uh, the weapon system I work on is 20 millimeter Gatling gun. It's got six barrels, fires 4,500 rounds per minute. 20 millimeter tungsten rounds can engage targets out to a mile up and has a, a thermal targeting um, camera on it, as well as you can turn on auto and just go to lunch and it'll shoot down any incoming, anything that's moving faster than 200 knots. So it's a self-defense weapon designed to shoot down missiles. Um, what was that last question there? The take on MA. So in the Navy, master at arms is our military police. Um, they stand watch at the gates. They are the people who are going to sit in a car and pull you over if you're speeding on base. They do all the cop type stuff. Um, so, I mean, my take on them is that I suppose they fulfill a, an important function, but I don't like getting pulled over. So <laughs> that's my take. Um, let's see. Is it possible to come in contact with? Oh, is it possible to come in contact with Somalian pirates? Yes, it is. Um, in the movie, um, shoot, what was it? Tom Hanks was the, the pilot of that cargo ship and the pirates took the hostages. Uh, our SEALs actually um, were the ones that took those pirates out. So it is possible generally when we come in contact with pirates, they know who we are. 
They don't want to mess with us. So they just throw their weapons over the side and pretend like they're fishermen. Uh, we had that happen a couple of times in the Persian Gulf. So yes, you could potentially come in contact with pirates, but um, they're not going to try to hijack a Navy ship. All right. So the request is to speak about different jobs. So on an, on a Navy ship, we've got everything you can imagine. Like I said, we're self-sufficient. So we've got everybody from IT people um, to, to work on our communications and our computers. All the, you know, we've got all the fire controlmen who work on the weapon systems. We have bosun mates who steer the ship and do all the mooring and anchoring evolutions. We've got culinary specialists to cook food. We've got engine men who, you know, make sure our, propulsion through the water is working we've got electricians everything you can imagine pretty much it's on the ship um and then the sailors take part in the major evolutions everybody on the ship is going to be involved so when we take stores from a replenishment ship everybody's there breaking down the pallets and passing the stores person to person called a dixie chain you take the boxes and you throw them down to the next person and, and get all your vegetables and stuff on on board um and then when you're in port, you're going to take turns uh, doing force protection. So that's a unique thing about the Navy. Everybody gets a chance to be uh, security personnel. Um, you learn, you'll go to the reaction force training. You'll learn how to shoot a pistol and a rifle. And you'll stand armed watch, checking people's ID, making sure that there aren't any unauthorized personnel coming on the ship, et cetera. Um, so that's a big part of being in port is just making sure the ship stays safe and your shipmates who are working on the ship don't have to worry about unauthorized people coming on board with ill intent. So, um, you can, you can do almost anything you want to do in the Navy. We're the only branch that has a nuclear engineering program. So if you're exceptionally gifted in math and science and you're looking to do something in the engineering field, um, Definitely give it a look. Our, our nuclear engineering program has been going on for over 30 years. Every single one of our submarines and um, aircraft carriers has nuclear reactors on it. And we've never had an accident. We've never had a spill. We've never had a mishap. Uh, we have a really great squeaky clean safety record when it comes to nuclear power. Uh, something we're really proud of in the Navy. Um, and then we also have a ton of aviation. I'm sure some of you have seen the movie Top Gun. Um, naval, naval aviators are the tip of the spear. We go um, all over the world and can engage targets uh, firsthand because our aircraft carriers are moving airports. So um, one day you might be in Hawaii and then you get a mission and the whole battle group is going over towards Japan or Korea or whatever. Uh, let's see what that question was. Okay, so the question is the connection between doing well in high school and translating to a high ASVAB score. So um, high school is your basis of understanding of knowledge um, for your adult life. So it's important to learn the basic skills that they're going to teach you in high school. If you can't read a paragraph in your own native language and comprehend it, you're gonna have a hard time being a functioning adult. That's just the truth. Um, if you don't know basic math, you're gonna have a hard time being a functioning adult. When, it, when you are renting a place and you've got bills and you gotta figure out what money you can spend on discretionary things and what you need to save, it's gonna be difficult to do that if you, if you don't have any concept of, of math. Um, so the connection between um, doing well in high school and scoring well in your ASVAB is the ASVAB is based off 10th grade knowledge. So 10th grade math, geometry, basic algebra, uh, paragraph comprehension, word knowledge, stuff like that. It's that's what it's based off of. So if you can if you do well in high school, you study, you pay attention to the material and you focus on what you're doing, um, that's going to translate to learning more, which is going to help you do better on the ASVAB. The higher your ASVAB score, the more options you have in uh, choosing careers in the military. So it's, it's basically the higher you get, the more options. It's, it's pretty simple. Um, 
sorry. Okay, so civilian side of the Navy. Um, a lot of the people in the Navy um, choose to do one tour and then they'll work for companies that support the Navy. So for instance, um, on our weapon systems, we have what's called a tech rep, a tech representative. That's someone who's knowledgeable about the equipment, but it's for everything. It's not just weapons. It's everything you can imagine. We have hoists and gas turbine engines and everything you can imagine has civilian counterparts who are subject matter experts. So if you serve and then you decide to get out, work on a degree or whatever, your job experience that you have from the Navy can segue into being hired by one of these companies like Lockheed Martin or Raytheon. And you'd be a, a contractor working for the government, um, but as a civilian. Um, obviously, the benefits are great. The money's good. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to move around and do different things. So uh, having that military background is going to help you in a lot of ways, whether it's, you know, something completely not involved with the military or, you know, like if you want to go into law enforcement or, you um, the tech sector or whatever, just having clear uh, uh, security clearance and knowledge is huge. So um, let's see what other questions we have here. Uh, so uh, uniform standard in the Navy, uh, we've got a bunch of different uniforms. We've got dress uniforms, uh, our dress blues for the winter, dress whites for the summer. Um, we've got this a Naval Service uniform. We've got our Naval working uniform, which is a digital camouflage that you might see on some of the people. And then on a ship, we wear coveralls because you do get dirty on a ship sometimes working on equipment or whatever. So it's easy to just take it off, chuck it in the laundry, not have to worry about ironing it and stuff like that. I got a couple more minutes for questions if anybody wants to ask anything. We don't wear utilities anymore. Utilities have been phased out. Uh, we use the coveralls now. Uh, utilities were like, like these like jean type material um, uniform uh, coveralls do it all now it's more fire retardant it's simple it's like it zips up all the way like a mechanic suit um, is it true that the seal scout people sorry scout people during boot camp all right so in the Navy, you can get a contract for special forces before you go to boot camp, And that's the way I recommend doing it. If you're interested in special forces, come talk to a recruiter now. We'll get you through the process. Um, once you have a, a good physical at MEPS, you can go and you can try out for our special forces program. We have five different SEALs, SWIC, rescue swimmers, air rescue swimmers, uh, divers, EOD. So if you're interested in any of those programs, come talk to a recruiter because we have active duty SEAL right now and a retired SEAL who did over 20 years with the teams who works with us in our district and they will mentor you and help you get where you need to be, especially high school senior. You got a lot of months until you graduate. That means if you join the Navy now, they have all between now and June to get you in shape, to get you faster, smarter, stronger. And that's what it's all about, building you up and getting you where you need to be. So if you're interested in special forces, it's extra uh, important to go and talk to a Navy recruiter right now. Um, for everybody else that just wants a job, um, we have a lot of great opportunities. Waiting isn't going to help anything. If you come in and, and we give you a practice ASVAB and it turns out that you need to study, if you wait until May or June to start that process, you're going to be waiting even longer until you're ready. Now is the time to find out. And yes, I do know Petty Officer Simpson. Uh, she and I worked together um, for a couple of years now. Um, as far as promotion in the Navy, uh, I made E6 in six years. So it took me six years to make the sixth enlisted ranks. There's only nine. So I think that's pretty fast. I'm up for E7 now. So I think it's pretty quick. Um, but it depends on your job. Each job is promotes differently. So we are almost at eight o'clock. Um, I really, really, really want to thank uh, Petty Officer Collins for speaking to our students and our parents and our families tonight. 
Um, do you, would you want to put your contact information in the chat so that if people, like what should people do if they want more information? What do you suggest? Right, if someone wants to, to, to talk to me or one of my colleagues, I, I'll drop my phone number in there. It's, it's 302-723-2174. That's my government cell phone number. You can call or text me. Uh, I like to ride a motorcycle, so sometimes I won't always answer because I'll be on the bike, um, but I will get back to you. And this mustache isn't an all the time thing. This is just November, no shave November. So uh, don't judge me too hard. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. That was great information. Really happy to hear your experience and you're certainly a very great representative for the Navy. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you. Have a good evening, everybody. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. So we're going to transition now to Sergeant Ivory from the Marines. Let's see where Sergeant Ivory is. Can you put your video on my video it's on yeah, there you are you you're perfect all right so i'm going to turn it over to you so you have um half an hour until 8 30 to um you know share information on the marines and also we can help you monitor the chat if you you know if you want to yeah. pause every now and then we can tell you what the questions are if that's easier yeah, Ms. Karen, can you just let me know when there's questions and let me know what the questions are so I won't be going back and forth? Yes, we can do that. So why don't you, after you talk a little bit, just take a pause and we'll read you any questions that there are when you feel it's a good time to take a break. Okay, sounds sure. good. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Thank Keep you. On. All right. So uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sergeant Ivory. I am your local Marine Corps recruiter for the area of Delaware. Um, I just want to start off uh, giving a little background about myself. Um, I was born in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, come from like a, a rough background. Um, you know, it was it was it was pretty hard. Uh, I went to college for uh, about two years, um, but then I didn't have enough money. Right? You know, money is a big deal when it comes to college. So I didn't I didn't have the money to pay for college, and my parents didn't either. Um, so I had to figure something out. Um, so um, I was working, um, but you know, that's just a day in day job, living paycheck to paycheck. Um, and I realized that I couldn't, I couldn't do that for the rest of my life if I wanted to live the life that I wanted, right? Um, so I went to um, the recruiting station. Um, I talked to every branch, uh, Air Force, Army, Navy, um, and also the Marines. Um, and I just wanted something different. Um, I wanted something that I had to earn. You know, I didn't want anything to be given to me. Um, I'm a type of individual who enjoys a challenge, uh, likes to work for what I want. Um, and I knew the Marines, after talking to all the branches, I knew the Marines um, was the branch for me. Um, it just, you know, sometimes in life, well, everything in life, that you want, I mean, it's not free. You have to work for it. Um, so that's, that's a, I've been in the Marine Corps for um, eight years. Um, my first duty station was Camp Lejeune. Uh, I was there for about three years and um, I got a chance to get, be on the ship with the Navy. Uh, so when he was talking about the birding and everything like that, um, I, was, he was, I was reminiscing. Um, I had a good time on the ship uh, with the Navy um, some say we like the, the men's department of the Navy. <laughs> uh, I, I do say so myself. I agree with that. Um, but yeah, the, the Marine Corps is uh, pretty much um, the Air Force, uh, Navy, and Army. If you put them all together and then put them on steroids, that's like the Marine Corps. Uh, we on a different level. Um, we ask a lot uh, from our, our applicants and our police and individuals um, who would like to be uh, a Marine um, and earn that title. Um, but at the end of the day, um, we, we put you through the rigorous training uh, and we let you know everything that you need to do um, in order to make it. Um, do I have any questions so far? Yes, you got a question from Jasmine um, and she said, did you go in as an E4? Okay, Jasmine, uh, no, I did not go in as an E4. Um, since I went to college, 
um, I used my college credits and I went in as an E2. Um, so um, in the Marine Corps, we, uh, we hop on small unit leadership um, and we are the few and the proud. We are the smallest branch. Um, and because of that, uh, we do have accelerated promotions. Um, so if you have any college credits, um, if you have done any kind of JROTC uh, in high school, um, we can take that and we can get you promoted and you can start as an E2 uh, in the Marine Corps. I hope that answers your questions, Jasmine. Okay, so if I don't have any other questions right now, uh, I just wanna let you know that in the Marine Corps, I mean, we pretty much offer the same thing as all the other branches. So I'm not gonna get into um, all the jobs because anything you think of the Marine Corps has, um, except for the medical field. Um, like I said, we are, you know, compiled with like the Army, the Air Force and the Navy. It's like all in one, one little um, branch. So I'm not gonna get into all of that, um, but I will get into something that I feel as though the other branches uh, don't offer, right? Because um, that's what you really want to know. Um, that's what really stands us and makes us different than the other branches. Um, and with the, what Marines, what we look for and what we harp on, what we take serious, um, all the intangible things, right? Of course, you know, everybody likes money. Everybody wants to get an education. Um, and that's fine. Uh, we, we offer that as well. We offer the same benefits, uh, medical and dental, uh, metal and dental uh, benefits. So. Uh, the, the things that really stand out is the intangible things, um, challenge, right? Professional development, um, self-awareness, self-confidence, courage, poise, okay? Pride of belonging, leadership. All of those things that you need in life um, is what the Marine Corps actually teaches you, right? Because um, if you don't have any structure, if you don't have any confidence, um, if you've never been challenged in your life, um, then you're going to wind up just being stagnant and not moving and progressing in life. And uh, I don't know about you, but I don't want to just be, you know, working at McDonald's for the rest of my life. You got to have some type of aspirations, some type of goals um, in order to better yourself. One of our leadership principles is no self and seek self-improvement. Um, so if you know you need work in something, that's what the Marine Corps does. They expose your flaws and your faults, um, just make you better at it. Right, um, we all about a family, um, that cohesiveness, um, and we all like brothers and sisters. Um, so that's where the pride and belonging comes in as well. Uh, we 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 work as together. We work together. We work as a team. Uh, we are only as strong as our weakest link. Uh, so it's it's pretty like a we got we got a lot of history and a lot of tradition. Um, it's very serious, um, and it's very difficult as well. Um, it's not easy. Um, it is the hardest branch. Um, it, like I said, and like the other recruiters said, um, every branch is not for everybody. Um, if you are uh, tough, you feel like you, you got what it takes. Um, if, you know, you like to earn what, you know, what you want um, and nothing given to you, um, then the Marine, and the Marine Corps might be for you, right? Um, if, you, if you care about not, if you care more than about money and more than um, about medical and dental and if you actually want things that make you a better person um, a better individual not only to help yourself but to help your families and others um, then the Marine Corps uh, would be good for you uh, do I have any other any questions as of right now yeah we have another question um, from Jasmine as well she said is the Marines mental Uh, is the Marines mental? Um, yes. As far as what, Jasmine? Uh, boot camp? If you're talking about boot camp, yes. Boot camp is uh, more mental than physical, right? Our boot camp is three months long. Um, and it's, it's, you go through physical training, uh, very rigorous training. Um, you work up to all the way up to five miles in running. Uh, we do something called a PFT, a physical fitness test. Um, but yes, yes, Jasmine. Um, when it comes to the Marine Corps and boot camp, 
everything is mental. Some might think that it's physical um, because we work out a lot, but as long as your mental is strong enough, you, you can make it through anything. Um, and we all, and, and that's why we offer a program. Um, it's called the Delay Entry Program. Um, and we like to, you know, offer that to high school students. Um, that way we can train you guys and get you ready for a uh, recruit training, okay? Um, the Delay Entry Program is uh, real easy to get into. As long as you meet all of the qualifications and the requirements, um, then you will be able to uh, be a part of the pool program. Um, and in the pool program, um, what happens is uh, we are kind of like uh, your big brother, your big brother or sister, uh, a role model. And what we do is we just make sure that you are on track to graduate on time. Um, we need to be in contact with you at least uh, once a week, have you come into the office or we come to see you. Um, you know, due to the corona and the pandemic, we still try to uh, make sure we take care of our police. Um, if you get into any kind of trouble, um, you know, we should be the first ones to, to get a call so we can try to uh, rectify that situation. Um, and pretty much what we, we, we do a lot of things. Um, we go to uniform museums, we have a lot of uh, cookouts. Um, last uh, Halloween weekend, we had a Halloween PT where we, we dressed up in uh, costumes. And, uh, we had a pumpkin and we was working out with the pumpkin and we let the police take the uh, pumpkins home and, uh, they did a little carving and sent us the videos and stuff like that. So um, we had a good time. Uh, pretty much, we just want to build that camaraderie and uh, that family feeling uh, because we we work hard, but we, we play harder. Uh, Marines, um, we like to have fun and uh, we just work hard. So I feel like we deserve that. Uh, so I hope that answers your questions, uh, Jasmine. Uh, to go more in, in detail with the Delay Entry Program, um, as long as you are on track to graduate um, and you have some what of a commitment uh, to serve your country, um, whether that is 100%, we'll give you 200% of our time and our dedication uh, to get you ready for recruit training. Okay. Um, Can I add to that? Yes. Hi, everybody. I'm Staff Sergeant Armstrong. I'm sorry about my outfit. I just came from the gym. Um, but Jasmine, just a little bit about the physical and the, you said it was meant, if it, you asked if it was mental. Um, I'm only five feet tall and I weighed 112 pounds when I went to boot camp. I didn't think I was going to be capable of doing it, but the delayed entry program trained me. They helped me. They prepared me. Um, they got me ready to go to boot camp. So going through the whole thing, as long as you're mentally strong and you have heart and you put it, you put your all into it, you can definitely do it. So I always use myself as an example because I didn't think I was capable of doing it. And here I am 10 years later. So <laughs> you can definitely do it. Bye, everybody. Yes, that's us. That's our Armstrong. Um, she's pretty short, but uh, she became uh, a Marine about 10 years ago. Uh, and now she's the station commander here uh, doing great things. And I'm glad that she's my boss. So um, yeah, the delay easy program. This is just like um, Staff Sergeant Armstrong said, is to get you ready and prepared for a uh, recruit training. Okay. Um, we have a few other questions. Somebody asked, does anybody fail boot camp? The question was, does anybody fail boot camp? You will only fail boot camp if you give up on yourself. Um, that's the only way you'll, you'll fail boot camp. Um, the delay entry program is there to make sure you guys won't uh, fail the boot camp. No one in the pool program uh, in the state of our, in Delaware has uh, failed boot camp because we run a, a good pool program. Um, as long as you come in to uh, do some type of physical exercise with us and uh, train with us, there's no way you can fail. Uh, even if you go to boot camp, right, um, and you have that thought of, oh man, you know, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can make it. Your drill instructors, they will not let you fail. Um, they will push you and train you. They are there to help you. Um, they are there to break you down and build you up uh, and pretty much enhance your, your traits that you already have and just uh, give you some unencouraged commitment with that. Um, so you can only fail if you fail yourself. If you, just, if you say, I give up, the drill instructor, the Marine, because I'm a Marine, I know how it is. I've been to recruit training. If you say, I give up, uh, the drill instructor Marine is not going to give up on you. They're going to keep pushing you. They're going to keep pushing you. 
Um, we push you to your limits, see how far you can go. Um, they do that a couple of times. Um, but like I said, Marine Corps is very challenging. Uh, you only fail if you give up on yourself. You know, about the, if you, you know, about the fourth, fifth time, you give a general instructor some type of, you know, attitude and you say, I quit, I can't have this. You know, at that point, um, then they, they will let you, you know, go, go about your business because at the end of the day, we are Marines uh, and we are here uh, to serve our, our country and protect you guys, protect everybody in the world. Um, so we don't want anybody, you know, on our side who is going to give up because if they give up, that puts everybody else in jeopardy. Um, people get hurt and that's thing, you know, we can't defend you guys. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Awesome, great. And we have another question asking if you can go in more detail about the career opportunities in the Marines. Oh, yes, yes. Um, so in the Marine Corps, we have over uh, 300 different jobs, right? Um, so the Marine Corps uh, is broken up in the Marine Expeditionary Force. So there's, it's made up of four, right? Um, it, it's around the whole US. So you have your, your division, uh, which is comeback arms. So your infantry, your grunts, your artillery, your motormen, um, and then you have the air wing, um, aviation. Um, so anything you think of um, like a, mo a low master, uh, uh, av avionics, um, a mechanic, air wing mechanic, uh, Stash on Armstrong um, is actually in the air wing. Um, and then you have uh, service support. Your, uh, your your comeback support, which is what I am. Um, so <laughs> logistics, um, you have supply, um, you have your MEMS clerks, um, you have your truck drivers, uh, things of that nature. Um, and then you have the command element. So when you talk about intel, um, intelligence, uh, counterintelligence. Um, so anything you can think of when it comes to the civilian world, firefighters, we have that police officers, we call them MPs, military police. Anything you can think of that is out here in the civilian world, we do the same thing, right? Uh, we send you to uh, the former schools. Um, you get the same training as if you were going to a trade school here. Um, get the same certificates. Um, you get um, taught by professionals um, in that subject matter field. Um, and then you also get college credits. Um, for, for going to those classes as well. Um, you also get college credits for our recruit training. A lot of people don't know that um, because it's difficult and hard. Um, that's kind of like an incentive uh, for you if you were thinking about doing or uh, well, furthering your education. So yeah, we have any job you think of except for medical. Um, medical, we don't have that. We use the Navy for that. Awesome, great. So we have another question um, asking, did you get called to go into combat? No, I did not get called going um, to go to combat. I wish I did. Uh, only comeback I do is a uh, call of duty. So if anybody out there wanna, you know, give me a username, I go ahead and, you know, add you guys in. That's the only time I, you know, go to comeback. Uh, but besides that, no, I have not been to comeback. Um, I have been deployed. Um, I lived in Japan for two years. Um, I've been, like I said, I was on the ship with the Navy. Um, I was aboard the U.S. Mesa Verde. I was, I was able to travel the world. Um, but no, never seen come back. Only, uh, you know, most people think that in the, the Marines is full of just killers and people crazy and stuff like that. Um, but majority of the Marine Corps is a support element, right? The only people who have boots on the ground and are trying to, and protecting the country with, with the weapon is the infantry. Um, so it's only a small group of those trained very well. Um, and it's very hard to actually even get that job because um, those are the first ones to go. Great, thank you. So we have another clarifying question. So do you enlist right into the Marines or could you also enlist into the Navy and then go into the Marines? 
So the Marines is a department of the Navy. Um, so you, you, you have to enlist in either the Marines or the Navy. Now you can enlist in the Marines, do your four years, uh, you're obligated four years and we get out, you can transition and go to the uh, Navy um, and vice versa. Um, it's two different branches. Um, so that's how, that's how that would work. Okay, awesome. That makes sense. Because um, we got a question early on asking um, in the last segment, asking about the difference between the Navy and the Marines. If you wanted to go into more detail about that. Yes. So um, the Marines is, <laughs> we are the Department of the Navy. Um, we are like the, like I said, the, the men's Department of the Navy. So um, when it comes to the Navy, um, you can do onshore duty or offshore duty. So you're either on a ship for a certain amount of time um, and then you serve off ship for a certain amount of time. Um, they have a, a lot of jobs as well um, to include medical. Um, so the Navy is pretty much uh, protecting our, our waters. Um, there's always a ship in the water. Um, we always have a US presence uh, just showing that we are out there protecting um, us back here, back at home. Uh, so that's pretty much uh, what the Navy does. They they patrol and protect our waters um, so no one can, you know, put harm on us, right? Um, and the Navy, I mean, the Marines, um, we, like I said, it's like every branch in one. So we do, we go with the Navy um, and protect them and protect the, the uh, country as well. Um, we trained uh, the army, we trained with the, the Air Force. Um, I mean, it's every branch in one when it comes to Marines. So anything, we have our own air room, so we don't need the Air Force uh, to get on planes or to do any kind of aircraft thing. We have our own air, air wing. Uh, we have our own comeback element. So when it comes to actually boots on the ground, um, but it's going down range. We have our own infantry. Anything you think of, we have our own. It's just like a mix. It's like a big bundle, a big mix, and just trained to the best of how someone can be trained. Like we the best of the best. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it's hard, but if you want to be the best of the best, if you want to be great, if you want to get things that are intangible, so if you want things that's gonna better you in the long run, uh, not just thinking right now, uh, but in the long run, then the Marine Corps would be a good fit for you. So we have another question asking about some advice that you would give for a high school student when they're deciding about which branch they should pick um, in the military. Okay, um, that's a good question. Um, to be honest with you, it all depends on you, right? Um, so as a, as a high school student, you have to think about what you, excuse me, what you would like to do in life, right? Um, first, you got to think about where do you see yourself in five years? You got to set a short-term goal. Um, then you want to uh, set a long-term goal. So you just got to sit down, really think, ask yourself, what do I want to do, right? When you figure that out, then you kind of put yourself, you try, you, you kind of put yourself in, in a situation as if you were a Marine or if you were in the Air Force or whatever branch or whatever the case may be. Um, and then you take that feeling. So when you imagine that, you take that feeling. And then if you like that feeling, that's what you should go with. Um, the Marine Corps, I would, I mean, of course I'm biased because I am a Marine, um, but here in the Marines, you're not, you're not just a number, right? It's, you, you are becoming part of history. You are a Marine, a United States Marine. Once a Marine, always a Marine, right? Um, and it's my job to you know, ask those questions to that individual, figure out 
what they really need and want in their life um, and then just steer them in the right direction, whether that is being a Marine or not. Um, so the best advice I can give you is just sit down, think about what you wanna do, imagine yourself doing it in whatever branch you're thinking about doing it in and see how that makes you feel. <laughs> You know, go with your feeling, go with your gut. Um, and Stats on Armstrong yeah, would like to add something as well too. That was one of the questions I had when I was in high school was what branch is the best for me or what branch would suit me the best? What the advice I give now is talk to every single branch. You have nothing to lose. Yeah. Um, once you sit down with them one-on-one -on -one, and you're gonna, like Sergeant I was saying, you're gonna get that feeling like you're gonna, they're gonna say something that is gonna make you say, hey, I wanna be a part of this. What it was for me was intangible traits, like things that people couldn't teach me, like leadership, courage, being stronger than I thought I could be, um, being able to challenge myself to become the best version of myself. That was something that the Marine Corps specializes in. And that's something that they told me um, that no one else did. And I think that's what made me want to be like, OK, I can be better than this. I can be better than what I am today. Um, I can challenge myself. I can push myself and, and have that great group of people um, just because pride of belonging. Um, we're like a huge family. So you have that support. You have those people that encourage you, that motivate you, um, that just kind of push you to, you know, be the best version of yourself. And that was something that I loved as well. Um, and so, yeah, just talk to every branch, see what, what works the best for you. And um, that's the best advice we can give you just because, like I said, you're looking for something specific and something made for just you so yeah 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 and um it's a it's a big decision it's a tough decision so you want to make sure that you talk to every branch and you really find out and know um, what you're getting yourself into before you know you get into it Um, so we have another question from somebody, a student who asked, if you were to go into the field, would you see other countries' military people as well? Well, when you say the field, um, as a Marine, we go to the field all the time, right? Um, so that's, a, that's one thing also that uh, makes us different from other branches. Um, no matter what job you have, uh, uh, the Marines, we teach you how to uh, shoot a weapon. So every Marine is a rifleman. Every Marine is qualified uh, to shoot a rifle, right? Myself, I am an expert shooter. And what's my job? I'm logistics, I'm supply. Um, and that's that's another thing that sets us you know, apart from other branches because it doesn't matter what job you have. If you wear in a uniform, if you wear in a uniform and you do go to the field, um, you know, the enemy doesn't care if you are a cook or if you are an aviation mechanic or a truck driver. Uh, they don't care. If they see you with the uniform on, they're going to shoot at you, right? Uh, so that's the big thing with us. Uh, we want to train you uh, to be able to protect yourself and shoot back, right? Uh, you know, I can't, you know, the other branches, they probably would, you know, if it's a cook, he might have to throw a spatula, but a Marine will be able to the marine cook will be able to shoot that um so yes we go to the field all the time um, but usually when we go to the field uh, we especially in the non-combat environment uh, we are uh training right practice make perfect um, so what we do is we just go to a, the field go to a like it's kind of like camping right go to a campsite we build everything from scratch we make our own everything water uh, food um, we, we sleep in tents. Um, it's kind of camp. It's just camping, and, and it's fun. Um, now, if we go to the field, as in like we're deployed, yes, uh, we do see um, the other military service. Um, like when I went to Korea, um, I actually seen Korean Marines. I didn't even know <laughs> I was in the Marines, and I didn't even know that there's another country that trains just like us. Um, we teach them everything that they do and they wear everything that we wear. They sing the same cadence that we sing because they want to be like the best in the U.S. and they consider the Marines the best. So they try to train like us and do the things that we do. And when we go over there, we like celebrities. Like 
they are they I would give them they would like to trade stuff. Like I would give them a chevron off my off my utilities, off my uniform, and they'll give me money and food just to get a chevron from a real marine. So yes, you do see uh other military members when you go out to the field um, when you're deployed. We have to um, wrap it up in just a second because we have the Air Force coming on next, but I want to address one, if you can just address this question really quickly. What's the yes. difference between being deployed and stationed? Okay, so um, being deployed um, is leaving your your main duty station. Um, so um, going overseas uh, and being on the ship uh, with the Navy, uh, flying out to uh, different countries uh, and serving your country overseas that's being deployed. Being stationed uh, is working a nine to five kind of type deal at whatever station that you are stationed at. Well, thank you so much, Sergeant Ivory. We appreciate your time. That was really helpful information. Thanks for sharing your story as well. I think that was really helpful for students and families to hear tonight. Um, do you feel comfortable putting contact information in the chat? Um, what should students do if they want to follow up? Uh, yes, Ms. Karen, um, they can uh, go to uh, Middletown Marines on uh, Instagram um, and they can follow us, they can DM us there. Um, also, I will put my, my phone number in the chat. Um, if you guys are good, uh, my number is 302-423-4393. Um, here and uh, we are here located in the Middletown. Uh, we have an office in Dover and there's about three, three Marines here. So we'll be able to help you guys out. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you participating in this with us tonight. It was nice to meet you. Yes, Ms. Karen, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So now we are going to transition to the Air Force and we have Technical Sergeant Josh Stanley, who's on. Oh, there you are. Okay. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to you and you have till nine o'clock to share information on the Air Force. Thank you for being with us. Yes, ma'am. Hey, are, are we gonna run the slides um, or do you show me kind of just go off my own slides that I have? Um, we can make you the presenter if you have the- No, it's okay. No, it's okay. We, we can just go like this and I'll just kind of relay the information and then obviously I think at the end. Yes, ma'am, yeah. Okay. And, not, and yeah. we'll, we'll help you monitor the chat if you want so that um, we'll ha uh, share the questions that come up. Hey, but we can certainly share your, we can have you share your screen if that's easier. Well, I think Mr. Kelly said he can, he can run the slides as well, if, if that's okay. Um, might make it a little easier. If he puts them up. Yes, ma'am. Do you have the presentation? Oh, there we go. Perfect. Awesome, thank you. Awesome, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so like Ms. Karen said, I am Technical Sergeant Joshua Stanley. I'm the U.S. Air Force recruiter, um, enlisted in session, so I only recruit for enlisted, but I work out of the Dover, Delaware office. Um, been in the service uh, for 11 years. I've been recruiting for about a year and a half now. Um, again, I sit in the Dover area, so basically I cover all of Kent County. Um, I have the other contact uh, for the recruiters in the other areas as well, Kent or uh, Sussex and Newcastle as well. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, so what we'll talk about today, we'll talk about a little bit of the path to joining. Um, I'll go over qualifications, what the Air Force is looking for, um, some of the some of the main benefits that we offer, um, how you get those benefits, meaning what kind of commitments are you looking at. Um, and then I'll answer some questions. And then, like I said, I'll have some contact info up for uh, myself and the three other recruiters that basically cover all of Delaware for y'all. Um, so go ahead, next slide. Uh, so what is the Air Force looking for? Um, qualification wise, uh, anyone between the age of 17 and 39. Um, if you're 17, um, you do have to have a parent signature um, to enable you to be able to join. If you're 18, all we need is your, obviously your own consent. Um, being good physical health, um, what that means is you don't have to be in perfect physical health. We just, obviously, if you had past medical history issues that um, could potentially be major, um, some of those things may be disqualifying up front, uh, but there's also options still for you to join, um, even with possibly a waiver or something, but mostly looking for, obviously, people that are in good physical health um, that can uh, be ready to go right out of the gate. Uh, no history of depression or anxiety. 
not a conscientious objector. Um, if you're not sure what that means, it's basically just someone who has a firm or fixed belief um, against like um, bearing arms and obviously the potential of going to war because that is kind of what the military does sometimes. Uh, no outstanding law violations. Um, obviously, we, some people have speeding tickets, things like that. We're not, not, not necessarily worried about that. Outstanding meaning not paid. Um, certain things on your record are still, again, waiverable, um, but it, every circumstance is different. Every applicant is different. Um, no tattoos on hands, face, or neck. Um, and then lastly, have a high school diploma or GED. Um, and then obviously anything higher than that, if you have a college degree, um, that trumps those two things. Um, but a high school diploma or GED is the, is the bare minimum requirement. Go ahead, uh, next slide. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about benefits, some of the major ones that the Air Force offers, um, some of the biggest calling points for us. Community College of the Air Force, we have our own accredited community college. Um, it's basically an awards and associates of applied science degree in whatever your career field um, has a major in. Uh, you're enrolled automatically upon completion of BMT. Um, everything is accredited, meaning you can transfer it to a bachelor's degree plan at another college and you'll still receive all the general credits that you got for your associate's degree. Um, but everything is, has a degree plan based on whatever job you have. Um, so for, for instance, uh, I'm a logistics guy, 2T2, which was air transportation by trade. So I have an associate's of applied science and transportation. Tuitions assistance. Um, what that is, is basically give you um, $3,750 a year to go to school um, all for free. So it's about four classes total a year, all free. Um, you can pick your own college. You can do it traditionally, um, meaning go in person or alternative methods such as online classes. Um, but 100% of that tuition is paid for by the Air Force. Air Force cool program, as you see there, is actually, um, let's say you're in a career field. Um, you do your four years and right before you get out, you're thinking about transition maybe to a civilian career. We will help you get credentials towards that. For example, um, if you were in cyber, you were going to get out and you needed to get like a security plus cert to be able to get a civilian job. The Air Force is going to help pay for that and get you that um, accreditation before you get out so that you can transition easier. Um, CLEP and Dante's, those are basically testing out options. So if maybe you can already pass a college math class. You don't want to retake a full algebra class to show that you know the material. You can take a test. If you pass that test, you get those college credits. Um, I've done it for about three classes. My English class, I, I literally went and took basically the final exam for the English class, passed it and got my three credits um, that I needed for my English class that applied to my associate's degree. And then one of our last uh, best options for education is the post 9-11 GI Bill. What that means is once you um, serve your time, you can get out with something that you obviously go to school and get a full education full time. Uh, 80,000 total, no contributions required, meaning we're gonna give you $80,000 worth of education and you don't have to put anything into that. It's all free to you. Can be used up to 15 years after separation. And let's say for example, like me, I've served long enough that I can transfer it to my daughter. Um, so my five-year-old, um, when she's old enough to go to college, will basically go to college on a four-year degree plan for pretty much free um, just off of my GI Bill. Um, next slide, please. Uh, training. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about training opportunities, basic military training, um, eight and a half weeks total. Uh, right now, it's probably down to about eight, seven and a half, depending um, just because of the pandemic stuff. So some things are transitioned a little bit, but standard is usually eight and a half weeks. Uh, purpose of our basic military training is to transition you um, into obviously what the Air Force is looking for. And that's that foundation of the Air Force life. Um, give you that independence and that confidence um, while also maintaining that discipline. Uh, technical training program. So after BMT, you go straight into your tech school, which is basically your job and how you're going to learn how to do that. Uh, very similar to almost any Vo tech school. So if you were to go into an automotive career field, um, just like you would go to an automotive tech school, um, we do the same exact thing. We send you to a, a Vo tech type school. All obviously with the Air Force, we teach you how to work on vehicles or whatever career field you choose and everything's free. And that's how you get your certifications. Um, it's provided anybody that obviously graduates BMT because everyone has a tech school related to their jobs. Some of them vary, some of them are very short, four to weeks, and some being really lengthy, such as like Intel or Linguist or something you're looking at, maybe 52 weeks, which is basically a whole year. All technical training that you go through is accredited. Um, it goes towards your degree plan. So if you earn credits while you're in tech school, those will go straight towards your degree plan, make it a little easier to get it in the long run. Uh, over 150 different jobs is actually up to 160 now. So right around 160 total jobs out there in the Air Force. Um, upgrade training, all that is basically when you get to your first base after you complete BMT, basic military training, and your technical training, when you get to your first base, um, now that you have that foundation, we're going to build off of that and make you an expert and professional in that, in that degree plan, in that career field. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> 
Uh, talk a little bit about money, everybody's favorite part. Um, so you get a monthly income, you get a base pay, um, and then we're also going to give you rent money and food money. Um, if you live off base in your own housing, then obviously we're going to give you a little more money. And if you have a family, then obviously we're going to give you a little bit more money. Um, if you're just a single airman, then you're just going to get your base pay. You'll still get rent money and food money, but it is a little less just because you only have to support yourself at that point. Um, pay increases, <clears throat> annual cost of living increases, meaning each year <clears throat> the cost of living in certain areas may go up, and mostly it's across um, the whole U.S., so you get a little bit of a pay increase every year just to accommodate inflation of the cost of living in your area. Promotion increase, so as you promote, you obviously make more money, and then as your seniority increases with those promotion, a um, little more responsibility, um, then you start calling the shots, you get to be in charge. <clears throat> Other money saving entitlements, medical and dental care, all free. Um, so basically everything medical related is free for you. All your dental is paid for, um, all your eye ophthalmology stuff is paid for. All medical care for the active duty member is paid for. You don't pay for anything medical related. <clears throat> you get a retirement plan. Um, our retirement plan now is actually really cool because basically instead of waiting and having to do a full 20 years to get any kind of compensation, um, you can do a four or six year contract and still get out with basically retirement pay or you can transfer to your civilian job and to their 401k plans. Um, so every time now, whenever you get out, no matter how long you serve, you're going to get to leave with a little something. VA home loans. Um, basically, we're going to help you buy a house. Um, I've used the VA loan home loans twice now. Um, I've bought two houses. I bought a house, lived there for a while, sold that, got another VA loan and bought another house. Um, I actually built my house. So it was really cool. Great opportunities. Um, and it's just part of um, some of those benefits afforded to, to military members. And then closing replacement allowance. Every year we give you money to pay for your clothes, your uniform. So like if you're using your uniforms quiet or get dirty, roughing them up, they got holes in them. we'll give you money every year to replace those. So next slide. How you can get all these benefits um, in the Air Force offer four and six year commitments to service, um, depending on what you're looking for and your goals in the long run. Um, you kind of talk about those with your recruiter and we decide what's best for you. But um, yeah, either a four year commitment or a six year commitment, either one will get you those benefits. Um, next slide, please. Now the fun part, um, questions, um, ask away. I'm happy to answer anything, so. Hello, so we had a question early on um, from Martha who asked, what's the best path to becoming a pilot and are you guaranteed placement upon enlistment? Uh, so best way to become a pilot, easiest way to do that um, is to go to the Air Force Academy. Um, that's in Colorado Springs. That is through the Air Force Academy, which is a four-year university, basically. That is the easiest way to be a pilot because basically you attend that school um, with a sole purpose that we're at the end of your graduation, you're going to be a pilot in the U.S. Air Force. There are other means. Um, I'm an enlisted guy right now. I've been in 11 years. I could still go back, apply for OTS, which is officer training school. If I were to get picked up, I would then apply to be a pilot. If I'm qualified, um, then I go to pilot school and I start learning that aspect of the job. And then once I graduate from all the pilot training, then I'm a pilot. Um, so it's easiest path to be through academy, um, but there's options um, through ROTC. You can be enlisted first and still transfer over things like that. So. Awesome, great. So we have another question from Connor who asked, would you recommend um, joining and then immediately going to college or staying enlisted for several years and getting in then? Um, so there's two ways. Obviously, um, if you enlist right away, um, you can go to college while you were enlisted. It's not necessarily like you think where you can um, just go to like a full-time college all the time for your degree plan. You're still going to work a full-time job on the enlisted side as active duty. Um, but in your off time, obviously, you can still pursue your education. Um, and I would tell you, yeah, as soon as you join once you're through your basic and tech school, um, yeah, they start knocking out degrees. Um, everything's it's paid for. It's free schooling. So you can take as many classes as you want as fast as you can get them. And the Air Force is going to continue to pay for those all the way up through your master's and doctorate degree as well. So and what was the second half of that question? Um, are you guaranteed placement upon enlistment? <laughs> Uh, you're not guaranteed uh, placement. So what happens is, let's say you pick a career field, um, you go to that, you go to BMT, then you go to your tech school. While you're at tech school, you're going to make a dream sheet, um, which is about eight locations. Um, you list them, obviously, number one being your favorite, number eight being your not so favorite. Um, and then the Air Force um, is going to put you where we need you the most. Um, so you're going to make a list of eight. You're going to get something from that list of eight. Um, so it's not guaranteed, but you do kind of have a choice of where you go. So. Awesome. So we have another question from a parent who said that their son is interested in special operations. What does the training look like? Uh, so um, caveat on that. So I only recruit for the enlisted side. However, my office partner, Director of Sergeant Ryan Reese, is actually the special operations um, special warfare recruiter here in Delaware. Um, 
So there is very intense training that goes ahead of that. However, um, up front, it's not necessarily you go straight into the training program. What happens is um, you talk with Sergeant Reese. Um, he does some pre-screen stuff with you. He has you come out to what's called a pass test, which is basically a physical assessment um, stamina test where you're going to come out. You're going to do a run, swim, pull-ups, push-up, sit-ups. He's going to see where you are as your baseline foundation. And then what's going to happen is if you can pass a pass test at a certain point, you'll be accepted into development. And that's when the training kind of um, ramps up a little bit, gets a little more intense, but you have to be accepted into the program um, prior to that through Sergeant Reese, which again, his only job is to recruit for the special warfare career fields. Um, and I can pass this contact info as well. So, Awesome. That would be great. Um, so another question from Jasmine who asks, what age can you take the ASVAB? Um, so sometimes in high school, they'll let you take it at the age of 16. However, um, the Air Force as a whole, if you take it the, at the age of 16, we can't actually count that towards your actual score if you were to want to keep that score. So the youngest you can take it is at 17, and then pretty much you can take it um, at any point in any age at that point. Um, if you take it at an official site, being like if you actually went to a military entrance processing station and took it there, um, it kind of depends on what you score. As long as you pass the test, then obviously you're fine. Um, but you can only fail it at an official site um, about three times total. But for instance, like in high school, um, if your school offers it two or three times a year, you can take it every single time um, and it's never going to affect anything. We're always going to use your most recent score, though. So whatever the most recent score you have for your ASVAB, that'll be the one that we would use if you wanted to keep it. So. Great. Um, so Aaron asked a question about the best way to budget while you're in the military. Um, so best way to budget, um, we actually offer budgeting classes, things like that, but my personal take on it, um, obviously coming in as an E1, E2, E3, whatever you're kind of coming out of the gate with, you just got to be smart with your money. Um, you're, if you're only making, let's say, for example, if you make $1,000 a month, um, don't go out and get a $700 car payment. Um, so the best thing to do, because we're going to be basically paying for your food, um, your housing, all that thing, everything's provided by the Air Force, you're just going to be looking at kind of the more um, leisure items as far like let's say you have a cell phone maybe have wi-fi in your dorm or your house things like that um, but just be practical with your money don't overspend um, plan accordingly and based off of what your lifestyle can handle we have another budgetary question yeah, somebody asked boy. should they buy a car <laughs> before um, basic training um, it kind of depends. So every situation is different. If you're asking me personally, like if you're going to go out and buy your own car through your own name and obviously you can try to get your own loan, um, I would say wait um, just because you never know where you're going to get stationed. You don't know what you're going to put on your list. You don't know what that next year is going to kind of look like for you. Um, so don't pay for a car for basically a year that you won't even really get to drive it while you're at basic training in tech school. Um, wait till you get to your first duty station, see how maybe how far work is from you or how um, far recreational facilities are from you to see if maybe a car is the best investment for you at that time. Great. Um, so we have another question from Jasmine, who's asking um, a clarifying question that she could be able to join the Air Force at age 17. Yes, yeah, so you can join at age 17. However, you do have to have authorization with your parents. <clears throat> um, doesn't always have to be both parents. Again, every scenario is different, but at least one of your parents has to sign off with you. Um, there's about three documents that you and a parent will sign together um, with your parent addressing the fact that they're saying, yes, I'm OK with um, my son or daughter. Um, joining the military so great um would you be able to go into some of the career opportunities um in the air force in more depth um uh, i can go in yeah try to go into some of them um so our biggest things obviously like almost across most of the branches um you have mechanical career fields electronic career fields administration type career fields and you have your kind of general um which is just your everyday life force support type stuff um general kind of going from um, like being a cop and helping out the base to uh, um, almost kind of like what I do, which is logistics, where we're still providing support, supply, um, equipment, things like that. Um, some of the medical stuff kind of falls into the general category because all those are for support on any base. Um, but career opportunities, mostly in the Air Force, I will tell you right now what we're looking for most is mechanical and electronic career fields. Um, mechanical doesn't mean just turning wrenches on airplanes. There's a lot more to it than that. Um, it can be anything from working on airplanes to working on um, things that pilots use, such as like uh, um, aerospace physiology, which is basically like all their masks and tanks and things that they use at high altitude, um, calibrating those, working on those, all the way to, you know, the electronic side where you're looking at all your cyber jobs, intel, um, aviation type stuff with avionics and communications, things like that. 
Um, so it really, obviously there's 160 plus, I can't go into each one of them, um, but it does break down into the mechanical side, electronic administration in general. And then obviously as we talk and I bring you in, if that's something you're interested in, we kind of kind of go through and gauge your interest to kind of find things that really suit you. Awesome, that was really helpful. Um, we have another question from a student who asks, how should you tell your parent or guardian that you want to join the military? Um, <laughs> for me, it's a little different, but uh, I think if, if this is something you really want to pursue, you kind of got to just let them know that um, all the benefits that it's going to benefit you in the long run of your life. Um, coming straight out of high school, you know, whatever opportunities may be afforded to you, sometimes they're not all there. Um, so if maybe paying for college out of pocket or trying to get a scholarship just isn't going to work out for you, um, then obviously joining the military is a great way to get a free education. Um, and that usually a lot of parents are just wanting something to make sure that their child's going to have a future. Um, the Air Force kind of does that with A, education, but B, um, helping you get certified and become an expert or professional in a certain career field to take those um, credentials to the outside world and just roll right into a civilian job um, where you're already basically qualified. That's great advice. So we have another question from Sean who said, is there an ROTC program for high school? And if so, does that necessarily mean you have to join the military? Um, so ROTC programs, obviously most of the Delaware high schools that I cover have ROTC programs. You don't have to be in ROTC to, to join the military. And just because you're in ROTC in high school um, doesn't mean you have to join. However, for college type ROTC, let's say you wanna enroll into a college ROTC program, um, what happens is you go through your first two years and at your two year mark, right after you almost finish your second year, you have to make a choice to either stay in the ROTC program or um, get out of the ROTC program. If you stay in it and you complete the, the two more years to complete a four years of ROTC in college, then at that point, you're going to join the Air Force because we're going to pay for your college. And for paying for your college, you're going to obviously give us the time back through service. Um, if you choose to kind of walk away at that point, um, it's almost like a no harm, no foul. You got your two years. Um, at least you participated, but if you choose to go on, then obviously you just have to find ways to pay for the rest of your degree at that point. Um, <clears throat> but if obviously you choose to stay in ROTC, we're going to pay for your college, but with the caveat that you're going to give us the time through service. Great. Um, so we have another question from a student asking, could I go into the Air National Guard in another state and get tuition for college? Um, so between the Air Force active duty, uh, Air Force Reserve, and then the Air National Guard, um, we're not three different branches, but we're three different entity, entities inside of the Air Force. Um, reserve and Guard both utilize funding a little differently. Um, so you can go to college in the reserves. You can go to college in the, in the Guard. Um, but some of the benefits as far as full-time um, tuition being paid for or the GI Bill, you get the GI Bill, it comes at a little bit of a different cost. Um, so that after you do your contract, you can use that to go to college. Um, but instead of getting like full time tuition, like we pay for obviously your full paid tuition, um, I think there's a caveat with the National Guard on depending on where you're at in service and what you want to do, how they pay for your college. Um, and it, state wise, Air National Guard is based on the state. So if obviously you want to join the Delaware Air National Guard, you're going to be here in Delaware. You're going to be going to your uh, drill weekends here in Delaware. If you join the Air National Guard in another state, you'll be assigned to that state. Um, so another student asks, what schools have JROTC because my high school discontinued it? Um, so it depends on what county you're in. Um, I only cover all of the Kent County schools for Delaware. Um, Cesar Rodney still has their program, Smyrna, um, I believe North Carolina, well, they're Carolina County. Um, so CR still has one, Smyrna. Um, I'm trying to think of who else that I know for sure has one. Um, so I, I'll ask the other recruiters as well, um, but I know CR and Smyrna are both kind of here in the Kent County or close to the Kent County or both have their program still up and running. I actually just spoke to the um, Cesar Rodney JRTC instructor today. So, Okay, awesome. And I just want to make a note that Tilly put in the chat that the Air National Guard will present next week on November 10th. Um, so Karen, do you have to go? Um, and the Army National Guard also will present on the 10th as well. Um, I see it says that Middletown and Apo Quinnemick High School also have programs. So are there any other questions um, for Technical Sergeant Stanley? Oh, good. There's your contact information. 
Oh, yes, ma'am. Yep. So there's my contact for obviously Kent County. That's where I cover. Also cover Caroline County, New Maryland, kind of relevant for the Delaware folks. Um, Sussex County, um, is Sergeant May right now. He sits in Salisbury, um, but he covers all the way up to we we have meet somewhere around the Bridgeville area right now. We both kind of cover Sussex County as best we can. Um, and then Newcastle County up all the way through Wilmington is Sergeant Swanson and Sergeant Duga. And those are our phone cell phone numbers right there for you. Awesome. I'm sitting here with an Air Force vet also. <laughs> wanted to hear your presentation. <laughs> hey, sir, how you doing? I'm doing very fine. You sounded really good. I think I'm going to enlist. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, real quick for the person asking about Sergeant Reese and the special warfare stuff. Let me grab his contact for you real quick. Um, just so you have it. Um, so Sergeant Reese is a special warfare recruiter for basically all of Delmarva. Um, he covers, like I said, all the way down to Virginia, all the way up to almost Pennsylvania a little bit. His cell phone number is 302. 2879018 Awesome. Well, we thank you so much for Wait, there's a question. So, to expand on that about Middletown and Apo having programs, would I have to go to that high school to attend ROTC? You have to be a, a student in that high school. I do believe so. Now, don't quote me on that. Everything's a little different now with the pandemic. Um, I do know that a couple of the schools that I do cover um, kind of disbanded their JARO TC programs. Um, so maybe there are some options there to uh, po possibly kind of finish out some of your time um, with another high school. Um, definitely something to look at. I'll try to reach out and see if that's even an option. Maybe get back with Miss Karen to let you know. Um, but I don't know 100% just because of the, the way school attendance works, but I can definitely reach out and find out. Yeah, I would also ask your uh, school counselor to the person who asked that question and, and they may be able to help find that answer out for you as well. So thank you so much for uh, being part of our um, webinar tonight. We really appreciate the information. Absolutely. Yes, that was a great presentation. Thank you. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, November 10th, we, again, we have the Army and the Air National Guard speaking um, on the 10th and the recording of this presentation will be posted on DelawareStudentSuccess.org. And if you have questions for me or anything about this program or other webinars, our email address is on the screen. So thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you for your service. Hey, appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Thanks for the support, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you.